Good morning, everyone from Washington, D.C. It's good to be back here after a couple of weeks away. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. My name is Randy Bell, and I am the director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlanta Council. Thank you all for joining us today for Energy Source Innovation Stream, where we aim to highlight new energy technologies with the potential to reshape the global energy system. Today we, today we will be hearing from Seth Gray, President and Chief Executive Officer of Lightbridge Corporation, who will discuss how Lightbridge fuel can enhance the economics and safety of nuclear power in traditional and advanced nuclear reactors. But before we get started, two administrative details. First, you can follow us on Twitter at AC Global Energy and use the hashtag innovation stream. Second, after Seth's presentation, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. And we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. I know there's often a lot of questions and we can't get to all of them. Um, if you're watching on another platform like YouTube, unfortunately, we cannot take your questions. So please let me welcome Seth to the Atlanta Council. Seth, thank you so much for joining us today. Real pleasure to be with you, Randy. Thank you very much. So Seth, how are you? How's Lightbridge? And how is the, the nuclear industry in general dealing with uh, the pandemic? Well, I'm well, family is well. We have uh, our plans of being empty nesters cut short a little bit as we have kids home doing college uh, by, by Zoom. Um, Lightbridge is doing very well during the pandemic. We are used to working remotely in, in, in an industry where people travel a lot. People are used to working from their laptops and cell phones. The industry itself, I think, has really been a bright spot in, in industries doing well during the pandemic. Uh, many reactors have gone through their fall refueling outages with hundreds of guest workers on the sites very safely. The reactors are regarded as critical national infrastructure with actual plans in place already to deal with such a pandemic and then adjust going forward. So the, the industry overall has actually been a bright spot during the pandemic for how to handle things. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, it's crucial to be able to provide power uh, when everybody is, is doing uh, university through Zoom, for instance. Uh, <laughs> the reliability of the grid is even more important now than, than it's ever been. Um, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, we have a really fantastic uh, audience today, so thank you all for joining us. Um, Seth, why don't you share your screen and uh, we'll come back to Q&A a after your brief presentation. Okay, excellent. So again, hello everybody, and we see there are people from around the world, so welcome to everybody. Uh, watching and listening right now. I'm Seth Gray, the CEO of Lightbridge Corporation, uh, ticker symbol LTBR on the NASDAQ stock exchange. And so I'll refer you to our safe harbor statement. And I'd like to frame today's uh, discussion around two races that I see the United States as being in, one strategic and one relating to climate. Strategically, the U.S. in a very bipartisan way and throughout industry is positioning itself as being in a race against China and Russia principally to deploy nuclear power around the world. And I think Russia and China have gotten out to a lead, but the U.S. government is now really stepping up to help U.S. industry compete and win against them internationally. Strategically, I think Russia and China have uh, benefited from deployment of nuclear power in ways that have hurt the U.S. in some countries. I think you'll see that in places like Turkey, uh, where since the Russian deal to deploy nuclear power there uh, has been signed, uh, there's been a deterioration in strategic relations with the U.S. Now, that's not completely because of nuclear, but, but at this point, I think you have to admit that it's, it's part of it, and, and you'll see these things go together very often who is selling a nuclear reactor and how strategic relationships follow in what could be multi-decade or even century, century long relationships where these plants last over 80 years in operations and then when the last plant is decommissioned can be 100 years later. And on climate, there's really no path to meeting climate goals that doesn't include a growth of nuclear power within the energy mix globally. 
and we need to deploy nuclear more around the world, increase the power from the existing plants. And in both of these areas, strategic and climate, uh, there's the direct effects, but there's also through the supply chains, tremendous business opportunities. And the United States also doesn't want to miss out on enormous opportunities for U.S. industry for jobs, both in the nuclear power globally, as well as uh, being a supplier to solve climate change. What we're doing in the context of these races to help the U.S. win and people we work with win is we've developed a new nuclear fuel technology called light bridge fuel. And this light bridge fuel is very different from what's been used in the reactors to date. What's been used are these little pellets stacked up in a tube uh, called a fuel rod. But our fuel rods are very high technology, solid metallic rod, no pellets inside the tube. A very different shape, different zones within the rod, and this technology that we've been developing is designed to go into the existing plants as well as new ones that will be built, significantly improve the economics of the plants by having longer fuel cycles so the reactors are shut down less often and by increasing the power output of the plants, dramatically increasing the safety of the reactors as well as the proliferation resistance in an industry that's already a leader in these areas, but this fuel takes it even further. Uh, there are peer-reviewed independent articles showing that this is the only technology that really could be weaponized from the spent fuel. And we'll talk a little bit today about how Lightbridge can help bridge between the current nuclear reactors and the ones that will come soon and the future reactors that you've heard about in other Atlantic Council sessions and others that you'll hear from in, in the coming weeks and months, that, that I think you'll see a continuum that this technology fits into. On, on safety, the light bridge fuel down the center line of the fuel rod where it's hottest runs about 1,000 degrees Celsius, close to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the current fuel used in reactors. Uh, the metallic fuel with these advantages brings tremendous benefits, including what's called a design basis loss of coolant accident where the water stops flowing, uh, that, that this fuel won't produce hydrogen gas that can explode. And that is one of the many tremendous safety benefits of the fuel that again have been independently reviewed and praised uh, by, by many leaders around the world, including the quote on this slide from, a, from the Norwegian nuclear safety regulator. In terms of economics, uh, we, we think this fuel brings many, many benefits to, to the plants, and you'll see um, on the Lightbridge website independent analysis of this, including from a unit of Siemens. But one way to look at this is that if you have to add baseload energy, 24 seven clean power to a grid or any power to a grid in an area that already has nuclear power, upgrading that reactor by changing to light bridge fuel will result in that added new incremental baseload power being the cheapest electricity on the grid. Upgrading an existing reactor by changing it to light bridge fuel is the lowest cost way to add baseload power at lower cost than wind, solar, natural gas, current nuclear, or coal. The US government is taking tremendous steps in a very bipartisan fashion and with the administration leading the way to support nuclear power, particularly advanced nuclear technologies. Lightbridge is now part of that effort. In December, we were awarded DOE funding, the US Department of Energy funding through what's called a GAIN voucher, the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear, for $845,000 to design an experiment to irradiate in the advanced test reactor at Idaho National Laboratory samples of our nuclear fuel. 
And this $845,000 is paid in cash three quarters uh, by US taxpayers, by the Department of Energy to Idaho National Lab, and one quarter in kind through engineering work done by Lightbridge. We think this is the first of what could be subsequent um, cooperation we'll have with the US government. And significantly for a first uh, funding grant, the DOE notes that awards over $500,000, which this one is, is quote, in cases with a clear need and involving a truly exceptional technology or innovation. So we're very happy to see Lightbridge as being included in that category for our technology. We have about 200 patents that have been granted around the world on this technology, uh, including 20 that were awarded in 2019 and already patents in six key countries awarded thus far in 2020. We, we see a continuum of the current reactors, more of a similar type that are being built and will be built in the future, then small modular reactors using similar technology on, on a smaller scale, and then what's called generation four advanced reactors, very different reactors and perhaps ultimately fusion. Uh, the light bridge technology is designed to work in what's called the water-cooled reactors, which include almost all of the currently, currently running reactors in the world and the small modular reactors that, that will be water-cooled, but not in the later generation four or fusion reactors. But the light bridge fuel will, will help with what comes next. For example, licensing of advanced nuclear technology. For example, we think light bridge fuels, say, in a small modular reactor can help with licensing what the generation four reactors will need, say fewer people in the control room, which saves money, fewer security personnel, an emergency planning zone that's much smaller, perhaps only to the site boundary, which, which results in paying less for emergency services out to a, a far radius, uh, but also, bring what these future reactors will need. Most of them will need what's called high assay, low enriched uranium and act like it will just be available when they need it. Lightbridge will be the first kind of fuel to use at very significant commercial quantities, the highest levels of enrichment of the high assay, low enriched uranium, which is still low enriched uranium and, and very safe. Uh, but we'll help bring that metallization that many of the advanced reactors will need. So, so we think you'll see a continuum from what we're doing toward what comes later, and then perhaps from the generation four reactors doing even more advanced licensing that will help then lead to fusion. We first announced the concept of this metallic fuel in 2010. In 2011, we established the Nuclear Utility Fuel Advisory Board, or NUFAB, where four large utilities that comprise half the nuclear reactors in the US are advising Lightbridge on how to design and deploy and license this fuel. There have been independent studies by Siemens and peer-reviewed articles. And in 2014, our first significant patent on this fuel design in the United States and about 200 that have followed. And now we're operating under this gain voucher leading towards licensing and commercialization and going back to how I began the presentation in ways that I think will be soon enough, quick enough to matter, both for helping the US compete in and win in the race to deploy safe, clean nuclear energy around the world and also to help prevent catastrophic climate change. This fuel will be, I think, very needed and helpful in that effort. We are always reachable here, particularly an easy way to reach us is ir at ltbridge.com if you have questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Randy. Seth, thank you so much. That was really, really fantastic. I have a ton of questions. Uh, I want to make sure to get to the audience as well. Um, 
And of course, feel free to ask questions in the Q and A. Um, get started. I want to get started on the technology piece for a second um, and how it changes uh, traditional nuclear power uh, plants and moving forward. Now, already nuclear power has the highest capacity factor of any power source, over ninety percent. Um, so, how does uh, how does what, what percentage increase will the light bridge fuel um, add to this already uh, incredible capacity factor? Well, it can be quite a bit. Um, think of it in a couple of ways. One is that the light bridge fuel will generate more power every day from the reactor, up to 30% more power every day in a new build reactor, up to 17, 17% more power in an existing reactor, if, if the reactor ha has the margin, the capacity to take up to that much power. Uh, secondly, the light bridge fuel has what's called a longer fuel cycle. So rather than changing out the fuel every 18 months, you could change out the fuel every two years or perhaps longer. And these refueling outages take several weeks. So by avoiding those multi-week shutdowns of the reactor and during those periods be producing more power than the reactor normally produced every day, we, we think you'll see capacity factors quite in excess of 90% with this fuel. Okay, fantastic. There's a good follow-on question from uh, Natalie St uh, Steverson, which is, um, uh, how, does, how would Lightbridge fuel help keep existing reactors in operation? Um, and can, can Lightbridge fuel be used in any type of uh, plant that's in operation today? Right. Well, the Lightbridge fuel will help keep them in operation because a lot of plants are being closed that are perfectly operational and safe, but are losing on economics to natural gas or renewables. So by bringing a significant economic benefit while bringing safety benefits as well, um, we think you'll see plants move into the column of, of being profitable that aren't now. Now, there also needs to be a, a look at how uh, markets are structured and give credit for 24-7 power versus incremental power. But overall, as we showed on one of the slides, this is the cheapest way to add incremental power is actually to upgrade to light bridge fuel. And almost all the reactors in the world could use this fuel, all the water cooled reactors can. Mm -hmm. So the only reactors that can't are the few remaining advanced gas reactors in the UK that are very close, very, very old and scheduled to close within the coming decade. The Chernobyl type old RBMK reactors in the Soviet Union and the um, couple of fast reactors that are operating in Russia but there are 419 commercial reactors in the world that could use this fuel out of about 440 operating in the world today. Mm -hmm. And almost all of the under construction and planned reactors in the world could use this fuel. That's remarkable. Um, you know, you're, the point that you made uh, early on that nuclear is a key part of meeting climate goals. Um, I, I think that's a really important message that needs to be uh, continued to push that be pushed out. And I don't know if you saw earlier this week, BP released their an, uh, annual energy outlook, and they had uh, three scenarios. And, and the headline was, you know, peak oil demand. But if you if you dig into those numbers, um, in their two scenarios where you meet Paris climate goals, nuclear grows. Um, and so you're hearing from any range of sources that nuclear is really, really important. You can't meet climate goals without nuclear. But, you know, the business model is sometimes a challenge. And I saw that slide where you had your original concept in 2010. We're now in 2020. Um, if you think about some other, you know, new technologies, new ideas that are, um, you know, startups, for instance, out in Silicon Valley, you know, Airbnb was founded in 2008. And, uh, within a few years, those guys were billionaires. Um, so how do you think about the business model? How do you, as you're developing this technology that takes a really long time, how did you make Lightbridge continue to be successful and continue to develop this um, as, as it takes a while for you know, a huge amount of technolo technological development, regulatory development, et cetera? Yeah, well, well first of all, um, we have to be very careful and patient in dealing with, with the business model and as um, for those who follow baseball, David Martinez, the manager of the Washington Nationals last year said, sometimes bumpy roads lead to beautiful places. 
And you have to understand <laughs> where this is getting to and the significant upside of it in the end. Uh, and, and that team won, won the World Series. Um, on climate goals, we're very happy to see statements like BP coming out of traditional oil and gas uh, on how much nuclear will be necessary, but also companies like Google that two days ago announced that they're planning to be carbon neutral in their uh, servers uh, worldwide and um, on their server farms and that they will include nuclear in that clean power. They understand at Google that they're going to have to have nuclear power. This is a massive build out that is coming in nuclear. And what, one of the things we did when we were first starting out in the company was we uh, did consulting work advising countries on um, how to start nuclear programs to bring in revenue that we used to launch the nuclear fuel effort. And um, that helped us start the, um, start the effort. Uh, then hitting Fukushima in 2011 really crimped the consulting work, but it had a, a really excellent start. And, and as for the new technologies, the new reactors, I'm very supportive of those. But I think most of those won't really be commercialized at global scale until after we've made it or not on climate goals. And I think what I like, one thing I like about Lightbridge Fuel is that it will come soon enough globally, hitting four, over 400 reactors that could use it right now, more under construction, and really impact climate goals as well as strategic goals soon enough to make the difference. You know, so we got a great follow-on question from Stephen Green. Um, so, uh, which is, you know, if you're going to use Lightbridge fuel in all of in these 400 plus reactors, um, you do need HALU. So, how does Lightbridge expect HALU to become available, and over what time frame? Right. Well, first of all, we expect for our, our testing and research reactors that will be made available by the U.S. government from U.S. government stockpiles. Secondly, we very much support efforts we're seeing um, to bring about new HALU supplies by the Department of Energy in the US working with Centris on demonstrating HALU production. TerraPower is now supporting that effort. They'll new ha meet HALU for their advanced reactors that fits in the continuum I was talking about. There are laser enrichment technologies being worked on. In, Nuclear, the uh, production of the needed materials tends to uh, meet what, what the customers need because it's such an enormous industry. And HALU is something that obviously can be produced technologically. Uranium has been enriched to way higher levels than that for other purposes. We know we can produce it. And I think the efforts by Centris and by DOE uh, will will help meet the commercial needs. And again, as the industry needs it, there'll be people producing it to supply it. And clearly DOE is willing to put up the funding to help make those efforts successful. So, so we're pretty optimistic on, um, on doing that, but also giving them a reason to support large near-term need for HALU with our fuel. Got it. Yeah. Um, we've got two Two similar questions coming from uh, Theo, I'm going to butcher your name, I apologize, Senis, and Stephen Dyke, um, asking about the economics and how, how does Lightbridge Fuel compare in terms of the economics to other carbon-free generation? Um, now, and, and could it actually overcome PV? Now, you talked about how adding Lightbridge Fuel would make it the cheapest low-carbon uh, uh, electricity added to the grid, but if you're thinking the overall economics of a nuclear plant, like a new build, um, if you're thinking, uh, you know, new, new build uh, Gen 3 plants in the United States. Right. Well, well, well first of all, um, if we're talking about the existing reactors, there's no question on, uh, on economic benefits. If we're talking new build, those have yet to be proved out. And we expect that this fuel um, will help those new designs, large and small. Uh, compete and win. And remember, natural uh, gas is um, emitting CO2 and it could face carbon taxes in the future. It could face challenges. It emits half the CO2 as coal. But we do expect that Lightbridge fuel and these more advanced designs, some of these small modular reactors, 
um, actually will compete and win against gas just on straight up economics. That's fa fascinating. Okay, a, a very spe specific question coming from Ray Watson, who I uh, think might be in Canada. Um, he asks uh, very uh, directly if these the fuel work in can do reactors. And if yes, when will that be available? Yes, we believe the fuel will work in can do reactors. We're, we're taking a look at that now. There, there's more work to be done, but we believe the fuel works in all water cooled reactors and the can do's are pressurized heavy water reactors. And we believe that that will work. And we'd expect the timing will be similar to, to what I showed on the chart, that by the mid 20s, we should be able to demonstrate that. Got it. Okay, I want to go to our friend uh, Nobuo Tanaka uh, coming to us from Tokyo. So uh, good evening uh, out in Tokyo. Um, he asks, what is the advantage of metallic fuel over the ceramic pellet type fuels? Is, and is this applicable to fast neutron reactors uh, with sodium coolant? Well, Tanaka-san, we're honored that you are on today. Greetings. And the, the advantages we think are pretty significant. We think that the ceramic fuel will never be able to bring the advantages of light bridge fuel in terms of power up rates, longer fuel cycles, added safety, added proliferation resistance that, that this fuel can bring. The fuel will not work in the fast neutron reactors. That would go in the category of the generation four reactors to come. As I said, I think it will help pave the way for those to come quite a bit later on a large commercialized scale um, and that the current reactors and others coming will, will give a nice 80 year market to, to light bridge, if not longer. But the um, metallic fuel um, will bring definitely significant economic and safety advantages over the ceramic pelletized fuel. Fantastic. Now, I, I'm gonna, we have time for two more questions. We have Mungo Park asked something that's a good follow on question to an issue you touched on um, about nonproliferation. And really, um, what sort of what is it other than how does the technology address the nonproliferation issue? You've said that it does, but how does that work exactly? Well, well, basically, what we're looking at is several areas through the fuel cycle, from mining uranium through handling the spent fuel. But just to for the purposes of a brief area, look at the used fuel, the spent fuel coming out of a reactor, and whether that can be reprocessed to make weapons. You'll see peer reviewed articles on, on our website that show how that really is not feasible. First of all, by making so much less plutonium 239, a weapons usable isotope of plutonium, in the spent fuel. Secondly, by combining it with other isotopes that not only won't be able to be separated from that in reprocessing, but also poison the. Uh, reaction so that it can't go super critical and even generate so much heat from what's called plutonium-238 isotope, it would even melt the device. So no, the plutonium mix is not only so small, but is of a composition that literally, you know, would not be weapons usable. Fascinating. Okay, I'm going to close out today. Um, so final question. So apologies to those who we have not gotten to, um, but close out uh, going back to uh, what I think was your first or maybe your second slide and framing uh, the competition uh, from the US uh, between China and Russia on, on nuclear power. So there's a good question from Bruce Lindsay about this, which is how do you protect your fuel design from China and Russia? How do you make sure that uh, that technology, the technology is not uh, not stolen? Well, first of all, for those of you whose questions have been answered, feel free to send them to us at IR at ltbridge.com. In terms of competition from Russia and China, they're both now on the side of the table of being nuclear vendors globally. And they're actually um, a little bit concerned about being protective too, to some extent of a, a intellectual property and contract rights to protect their own rights. But basically our patents have actually been granted in Russia and in China. And specifically to answer your question, are patents being uh, issued over 200 of them now so globally, Russia and China could not sell something to another country without violating our patent rights there. And I'll say the US is very clear that it would use trade sanctions under the World Trade 
organization to sanction a country that violated intellectual property rights in nuclear. The US is very, very protective of protecting IP rights in this area. So we, we feel we have a very big and strong friend. That's fantastic. That, Seth, thank you so much. Really fantastic presentation. Everybody, please feel free to reach out to Seth at the email address he gave. You, you'll be able to see this on YouTube later on um, and see that email address again. Thank you all for tuning in um, and really Seth for your presentation. Um, you can make sure, make sure to connect with Seth. I hope you will all join us for the next episode of Innovation Stream uh, on September 22nd at 9 a.m featuring ben, Benny Oyam uh, from uh, Anglo-American, who will discuss how Anglo-American aims to reduce carbon emissions in its operations by deploying a first-of-a-kind hydrogen mining truck. So that should be pretty cool. Um, also, please join the Global Energy Center on September 21st at 3.30 p.m. for a virtual event on grid resilience in the face of extreme weather events. Information on that will be on the Atlantic Council website. Thanks to everyone who helped put this event together, including Laura Macedo, Roger Morales, Emma Smith, and Olga Kokova. Uh, as I said, this presentation will be available on the Atlantic Council website, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So please do share it with your colleagues and please do uh, engage with Seth. Um, until next time, it's always great to, to see uh, our regulars for Innovation Stream and we look forward uh, to seeing you next week. Thanks so much and uh, have a good weekend.